Okay, fantastic. Yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about the political thought of Virginia Woolf. And I'll be using this as a foundation to talk about how we might respond to a writer's political thought and how we might problematize and push back against their writing, as Richard was talking about when developing critical thinking skills, um, and how texts like Virginia Woolf's work live on in the cultural imagination. So if you could move to the next slide, please. Mm -hmm. OK, so Virginia Woolf is a figure which you are maybe familiar with. Uh, she's been transformed into something of a cultural icon over the years. Um, her life and work have inspired many films, such as The Hours and Vita in Virginia. She's also pictured here on the top left as a character in Downton Abbey. Um, and on a tote bag, which you've probably seen around, which is quite ubiquitous, inspired by her work. So, yeah, they, I feel like these images really do represent how ubiquitous she's become in contemporary culture. Um, so she's become this figure that per permeates the cultural imagination in a similar way to Shakespeare or Jane Austen. And she's become synonymous with both an elite literary modernism and progressive social change. Uh, I'm going to be exploring how these two perhaps paradoxical images exist in kind of cohabitation within her work and how we might reconcile these contrasting images. Okay. Um, if you could move to the next slide. So Wolf was born in 1882 to an affluent upper middle class family who we might describe as bourgeois bohemian. Um, her, her family was quite well off and she was immersed in the arts and culture as her father was a writer um, who was able to, to support his family. She married Leonard Wolf, a fellow writer in 1914, and together they established the Hogarth Press, which published most of Virginia's work. Her most famous work includes um, Mrs. Dalloway, Orlando, and A Room of One's Own. There's an air of socially removed literary elitism uh, that pervades her image. And this was summarized by her husband Leonard in his autobiography when he called her the least political animal that ever lived since Aristotle invented the term. So Aristotle actually defines a political person as someone who is engaged with their communities. And many feminist scholars have engaged with Wolf's work on these terms. So even though she wasn't able to be involved in political life in the same way that a man might have been during this era, um, she was still involved in political and social era, social issues through her writing. So if you could move to the next slide. Um, so Wolf's political and social thought is crystallized in her book length essay, A Room of One's Own. These essays are based on a series of lectures that she gave at women's colleges in Cambridge, where she was invited to speak about women in fiction. And rather than just talking about women's authors and what they wrote about, she really problematized this question to make it one of economics, stating that a woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write fiction. And she puts this forward as a thesis as to why women hadn't really been able to write fiction previously because they just didn't have these resources. Um, so this, she, she picks up the threads of these, this argument in a sister text called Three Guineas, which was published in 1938, which I'll talk about um, later in the presentation. So if you could move to the next slide, thanks. So A Room of One's Own is narrated by a figure we can assume to be based on Wolf who spends the day at Cambridge University. And she describes, uh, she describes an incident where she's walking through the grounds, um, but she's interrupted by a man who tells her that she's not supposed to be there because she's a woman. Because women were granted access to the grounds of Cambridge, but there were rooms and libraries and er just areas of the grounds that only men might be invited to. And she encapsulates this with them um, this phrase, what idea it had been that had sent me so audaciously trespassing, I could not now remember. So she's basically saying that she had a train of thought 
while she was trespassing on the men's only ground in Cambridge. But this was interrupted by someone telling her to go away, basically. So it's, uh, it, it's a really good metonym for how someone's intellectual development is interrupted by um, social exclusion that is placed upon them. So the, w this incident, we're not sure if it actually happened or not, but it's very representative of women of both social standing. So as a privileged woman, she's granted access to elite spaces like universities, but not on the same terms as men. Like many women of her standing during this era, she is an outsider on the inside, still benefiting from privilege, but given a second class status to men. Yes, if you can move to the next slide, thanks. And this is quite representative of how women were treated at Oxford and Cambridge during this era. So there were women's colleges at Cambridge. Um, Emily Davis established Girton College in 1869, but women could study at Oxford and Cambridge without actually receiving a degree. So you would go to lectures and do everything um, the same as a man would, but you wouldn't actually be awarded the title of BA. And this wasn't universal in Britain. In fact, in 1895, Oxford and Cambridge were the only British universities to deny women degrees. Um, women were eventually awarded degrees at Cambridge in 1948. Oxford was slightly better um, with women being awarded degrees in 1920, but it's still, it's still kind of representative of how slow progress was at Oxford in this regard. And of course, this is only a depiction of life um, at university for middle and upper class women. It doesn't paint a picture of what people of working class and ethnic minority backgrounds, um, how they have fared in higher education. So when we examine Wolf's work, it's through this lens of a very privileged upper class woman. Um, if you could move to the next slide, thanks. So nonetheless, Wolf is able to use her status as an outsider on the inside to really depict how wealth functions at Oxbridge. So she describes how, in this quote, I won't read the whole thing, but she basically describes how um, Oxford and Cambridge have been wealthy for centuries and how this accumulation of wealth is able to fund lectureships and build new buildings and allow people to study without, um, without financial pressures. If you can move to the next slide, thanks. So by comparison, she depicts the situation at the women's colleges. So I don't think Gerson College has too much trouble financially now, but she describes how she goes to dinner at Gerton and, and is treated to a meal that's quite disappointing. So instead of being given grouse and wine as she would at a men's college, she's given water and prunes and custard and basically not a very satisfying meal. So she depicts how for women in this era, even if they were granted access to Cambridge, they were still like comparatively worse off um, in comparison with their male peers. So if you could move to the next slide, thanks. So this leads to her discussion of a character that she calls Judith Shakespeare. So Judith Shakespeare is a fictional character created by Wolfe um, and it's basically the idea that if Shakespeare had had a sister with his same gifts then she still wouldn't have been able to write great plays and have a fantastic career. So as she says, meanwhile his extraordinarily gifted sister, let us suppose, remained at home while Shakespeare was able to go to school. She was as adventurous, as imaginative, as agog to see the world as he was, but she was not sent to school. Um, so if you could move to the next slide, please. Thanks. So Wolf argues that women and other disadvantaged groups are still present throughout literary history, if only we know where to look. She says that Emily Bronte and Robert Burns, um, Emily Bronte is obviously a woman, Bro Robert Burns came from a working class background. Um, she says that these figures still exist in literary history, that, but they're just often hidden or marginalised. They're not 
they're sometimes not part of the main canon of literature. And interestingly, she says that I would venture to guess that Anon, who wrote so many poems without signing them, was often a woman. So she kind of characterizes the history of women's literary history as um, one that's kind of just below the surface. Uh, it's interesting here that she mentions working the working classes because this could be seen as sort of a blind spot within a room of one's own um, because she's mostly speaking from quite a privileged uh, background. It's uncomfortable for a woman who has never known poverty to speak about the poverty of middle class women. And when she complains about eating a meal of plain soup, beef and prunes and custard with no wine, her detractors might point out that she is still fortunate to enjoy a three course meal. I'm therefore going to use the rest of my presentation to discuss Wolf's representation of class politics, which she expands upon in A Room of One's Own sister text, Three Guineas. So uh, to go back to the Three Guineas slide, thanks. Um, Sorry, to the three guineas slide. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so three guineas is written nearly a decade on from A Room of One's Own. Um, and it kind it covers similar grounds to A Room of One's Own. But it's written as a response to three different people who are all asking Wolf for her financial support. A man writes to her asking how best to prevent another war. Another person asks, for donations to a women's college and someone else asks for a donation to a society for women's professions. So like, like A Room of One's Own, because it's based around donations, it's grounded in economic realities. So it continues the threads of A Room of One's Own, but in the light of the rise of fascism and with a more engaged thesis with class politics and economics. So you can move to the next slide, thanks. So Wolf has been accused of being politically naive within Three Guineas. In this quote, she claims that upper middle class women are actually at a disadvantage uh, in comparison with working class women, because she says that if the working women of the country were to say, if you go to war, we will refuse to make munitions or to help in the production of goods, the difficulty of war making would be seriously increased. So here she's actually saying that upper class women are, are worse off than working women because they're removed, of, removed from production completely, then they have no impact on society. This is an interesting idea, but it's used as an example of the fact that Wolf is quite disconnected from the realities facing working class women and how much agency they have. Um, oh, sorry, if you could move back a slide. Thanks. But this this might also come from Wolf's reluctance to speak on behalf of working class women. So in this quote, she recommends a book written by, edited, sorry, by Margaret Llewellyn Davis, which is called Life As We Have Known It, which is written by working women. Um, here she also criticises middle class writers who write about working class people without really knowing their experiences. So when we see Wolf kind of glossing over working class issues, it might be because she's reluctant to speak on behalf of them and is more willing to, um, to, to elevate their voices rather than um, speak for them. Uh, Wolf actually wrote an introduction to this text by edited by Margaret Llewellyn Davis. Oh, so you can move to the next slide, thanks. She also displays an ambivalence about being middle class and having this agency because she doesn't want to reproduce the ills, the social ills created by um, privileged men. She says that simply, you reply, that we daughters of educated men are between the devil and the deep blue sea. Between us lies the patriarchal system, the private house with its nullity, its immorality, its hypocrisy, its servility. Before us lies the public world, the professional system with its possessiveness, its jealousy, its pugnacity, its greed. 
So here we see the same kind of ambivalence with which she treats Oxford and Cambridge when she goes to visit them. She doesn't, she's aware of her own privilege, but perhaps doesn't want to reproduce the same systems um, that are oppressive or um, hoards of the wealth in the same way. So as an alternative, she suggests creating a society of outsiders, which she proposes is like a society of women who create different institutions from privileged men in order to create a better society and to prevent a second world war. And this includes a, a, a women's college, um, a progressive newspaper, and for middle class women to refuse to undertake work that they think is unethical. And she sums this up with the quote, the answer to your question must be that we can best help you to prevent war, not by repeating your words and following your methods, but by finding new words and creating new methods. So I think this is a really good example of how Wolf is using her status as an outsider on the inside to conceive of new, new social imaginaries. Could go to the next slide, thanks. And so even though Wolf is mostly focused on the social realities of middle class women, A Room of One's Own and Three Guineas both contain concrete examples of ideas for positive social change. So in A Room of One's Own, Wolf supports divorce laws, minimum wages and the modernization of household equipment in order to help working class women. And in Three Guineas, she endorses progressive education, state subsidies for underpaid or unemployed single women, as well as wives and mothers, and equal pay for equal work. And this could be inspired by her involvement with the Cooperative Women's Guild, who wrote the Life as We Have Known It book that I just mentioned. Um, this definitely had a big influence on her social thought. Um, it kind of like burst her bubble of being in her, her middle class, comfortable upbringing and definitely shows the advantages of exposing yourself to ideas and people from outside your typical circle. Um, so we go to the next slide. So Jessica Berman says that exploring these ideas in writing is really useful because social imaginaries provide the grounds of our construction of communities, as well as our understanding of our situation in the world among others. So this quote illustrates how even though writing might not be classed as direct action, it's still important for imagining how the world can be and trying to, um, yeah, in trying to envision how things can be improved by creating a collective social imaginary that people are working towards. Okay, so you can miss the next slide. So, even though we can we can see the useful political aspects of Wolf's work, um, there's still a lot of stumbling blocks that her, her work involves. So a lot, she's quite anti-Semitic in some of her work, despite being married to a Jewish man. She's famously a bit of a social snob. She wrote at one point that imbeciles should certainly be killed, which perhaps is somewhat facetious, but it does speak to a kind of snobbery on her part and kind of intellectual elitism. There's the problem that she, I, I mean, how can you say that someone so privileged can be an outsider, which kind of undermines the idea of the society of outsiders that she's proposing to us. And there's also her treatment of race within her work, which might be quite alienating to a contemporary audience. So at one point in the room of one's own, she says, it is one of the great advantages of being a woman that one can pass even a very fine negress without wishing to make an English woman of her. So it's it's points like this that make Wolf perhaps more difficult to discuss in a contemporary context. And it raises all kinds of interesting questions of how we deal with writers that we disagree with or who might be politically incorrect in a contemporary context. Okay, so we move to the next slide. So to kind of tackle this question, I wanted to bring in another writer um, writing in a contemporary context called Cabe Wilson, who wrote of one woman or so, 
Uh, Kabe is a former student at Cambridge who undertook the writing project, project of taking a, a room of one's own and actually cutting up all the individual words in order to make it into a new text. And on the screen here, you can see how, how he's done this and how he's altered the punctuation, capital letters and rearranged the words, in, words into, in order to make a completely new text, which is really an, in, an incredible feat. It's really, it's really interesting. Um, and so he makes this into a new text called Of One Woman or So by Olivia and Gilfrey which is similar to A Room of One's Own in that it tells the story of a young black woman at Cambridge and the struggles that she finds there, um, largely from having like an all white curriculum and um, having to deal with racism and things like that. So it's really a fantastic example of how you can take a text like A Room of One's Own and adapt it to a contemporary context. So you could move to the next slide, thanks. So this is another example of Kabe's work. Um, he also performed a kind of a performance art piece called the Dreadlock Hoax, which was based on the Dreadnought Hoax, which was a joke that Virginia Woolf and her friends played where they pretended to be foreign officials um, at the British Embassy by blacking up and speaking in um, like a pretend foreign language, which is definitely a difficult example um, to, to look at in a contemporary context. So Kabe Wilson kind of turned this on, this head, on its head by, sorry, if you could, um, yeah, this slide. So we can see Kabe during this performance piece where he was actually dressed up as Virginia Woolf. You can see that he's, he's wearing her style of clothes and he's put talc on his hair to make it look grey like hers. Um, and he, again, he, he used this as a, an opportunity to read from Of One Woman or So, the work that he created from A Room of One's Own. So it's really a fantastic way of engaging with work that we might find questionable today and invigorating it with new life and new perspective. Um, so yeah, that's Kathy Wilson. And if you could go to the next slide. So I think that these examples are all the more possible in Virginia Woolf's work because she does something called leaving room for the reader. She's constantly reminding us that her word on the subject is not the final word, and she's inviting us to draw our own conclusions. So in A Room of One's Own, she says, one can only show how one came to hold whatever opinion one does hold. One can only give one's audience the chance of drawing their own conclusions as they observe the limitations, the prejudices, the Id idiosyncrasies of the speaker. And in Three Guineas, she says, what ours can be, we have tried to show, that is, her opinion. How imperfectly, how superficially, there is no need to say. So she's creating this impression that she wants people to criticize her she wants people to speak back to her and that she has not she, she's not spoken the last word on a particular subject so if you move to the final slide thank you so as you can see here from these letters that wolf received in response to three guineas the afterlife of her work has been characterized by responses rewriting adaptations and new readings. Her writing lends itself to being reread in different contexts for the new ideas it might offer. Indeed, when I was preparing this talk, I found it a useful premise to simply reread A Room of One's Own and Three Guineas to see what I found most interesting about it at this time. And I was continually struck by new observations and new ideas that I'd overlooked um, in previous readings at different times. Um, as I've argued, I hope, I hope in this presentation, these new readings are not incidental to her work, but an essential aspect of it. Her writing comes alive through the way we might argue with it, push back against it, and reconsider it in different ways. And above all, what makes this possible 
is that through her writing, Wolf is always encouraging us to write back. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rowan. Um, that was really, really fantastic. Uh, lots of really, really interesting ideas there, and you've absolutely shown us uh, a lot of the depth and openness and complexity um, in Virginia Woolf's writing um, and, her, and, her, and her life. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, I, I, I'd like to segue us neatly on um, on writing back uh, and, and uh, other people's, hearing other people's opinions onto the Q&A section. Um, we've got already uh, lots and lots of fantastic questions for you, Rowan. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take them one, one by one. Um, there's a really um, interesting point to start out on, perhaps, um, talking about literary context. Um, so uh, the question is, did Virginia Woolf ever make any comments or take inspiration from Mary Wollstonecraft and her vindication of the rights of women? But perhaps also any other um, previous female figures uh, in, in kind of literary history that she would have, or you, you are aware that she took uh, inspiration from? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I didn't, I didn't go into detail in this presentation, but in A Room of One's Own, she is, one's own, she is kind of writing back to all of these figures. She does me mention Mary Wollstonecraft at one point, I think, and she's also talking about female social com campaigners uh, as well. So it's kind of, A Room of One's Own is kind of its own literary and social history of women's progress and women's writing. And you can see how um, all of these women that she's read kind of make their way into her work. Oh, sorry, Chris, I think you're muted. Oh, thanks. Oh, sorry, sorry. done it again. Mm -hmm. I was just trying to fiddle with uh, with screens. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you for that. That's that's really interesting. Um, I, I we've got so many questions, uh, so I'll I'll, I'll we, we can keep plugging. Um, so uh, someone's mentioned an interesting, another controversial point uh, regarding the imbeciles quote that was mentioned. Do you think there's a possible sympathy in there for kind of eugenicist ideas or um, was the word kind of used in different ways? Do you have any idea about that, that context? I think, yeah, I, I think it would have been used in a different context, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure if she's referring towards eugenics or anything like that. Um, she she definitely she in general she's speaking from more of a left wing anti fascist perspective, but I think I think you're quite right in looking at that quote in that way because even if that's not what she's talking about, it still it still speaks to a kind of intellectual elitism um, that looks down on people who haven't been educated or who don't think like her. Um, so definitely, I, I think it's I think it's interesting to to look at modernist writers in that context because um, while, mod while modernist writers are writing, there is the growth of fascism kind of always in the background. So that's really interesting to consider that context. Definitely, and kind of ableism as a part of, of that and kind of the idea mm -hmm. of intellectual lessness as, as, a, yeah, as an indicator of disability, absolutely. Um, yeah. Really fascinating question, by the way. Um, thank mm -hmm. you so much for whoever made that um uh so we've got some more um let's see uh can you argue um with this yes so can you argue that wolf's work is so well acclaimed um can you argue with i think i think the implication of this is can you argue with the fact that it's so well acclaimed due to the fact that it's so open to interpretation is a lot of its acclaim actually because it is so open to those interpretations and people can kind of project onto it um, do you see that, that has a role in the uh, critical reflection? Yeah, definitely. I think one of the reasons for critical acclaim or the, the fact that she has such a great literary afterlife is that a lot of people interpret her work in a very personal way and identify with her um, and have their own personal readings of her work. So that might be a way that we consider Virginia Woolf kind of beyond beyond the classroom or beyond critical discussions in university in that she's um in that way she's become maybe 
more anti-elitist because she's become open to such a wider audience. And definitely the, the variety of inter interpretation is a huge part of that. And do you think that kind of openness is um, is uh, surprising in, in an author of that period? Or uh, it's certainly modernism, you know, with its sort of complex texts. Um, is she uh, early in doing what she's doing or, or how, how does it sit in, in that context? Well, I think Wolf is really at the pinnacle of high modernism. She's publishing at the same time as T.S. Eliot and James Joyce, post Proust as well, because all these writers were very influenced by him. So I think she's she's writing alongside people who are, um, uh, yeah, writing very complex, maybe quite exclusive works, which are difficult for people to understand. But she did actually, she wrote in her personal diaries that she felt that writing should always be readable. And she did object to the fact that Joyce seemed to sacrifice this in his work. So I think she was kind of prioritizing the reader in this way and making it more open to being read um, in a non-critical context. Fantastic, thank you. That's really interesting. Um, I, I kind of want to move back onto the, um, the, one of the sources of her critical acclaim, I suppose, which is kind of her early, you know, being a feminist and, and that context to her writing. Uh, and obviously, um, you know, there was a lot of impact at the time, um, but uh, it has been asked whether her contribution to feminism is still relevant today, in your opinion, um, or is it kind of made redundant, perhaps, to some extent, because of its flaws, because of the lack of intersectionality? Mm. That's really interesting. That's a great question. I'd say that what makes her writing still relevant is the growth of things like intersectionality and different waves of feminism. I think they reinvigorate her work and make it more interesting. Um, so, for example, because of things like um, transgender rights, a lot of her writing has been reread in that context. So people have reread Orlando in, in the context of um, transgenderism. Um, she talks a lot about androgyny and, and the desire to be um, neither male nor female. People read that as kind of being about non-binary identities. Mm. So I think, I think um, yeah, these, these new debates in feminism are what makes her work relevant, paradoxically. But no, that's fantastic. That's, that's really interesting. Mm. Um, yeah, and, and thank you again for that question. We're getting some really, really interesting um, questions in here. So um, thank you. Thank you for that, everyone. Um, I, I'll highlight a kind of a bit more of a uh, one that's personal to you, Rowan, a bit more of a question on that. Um, was there anything that you disagree with in Virginia Woolf's um, opinions or in her, in her writings? And of course, you don't have to talk about, you know, anything in specific, but perhaps just an example of where you kind of diverge uh, will be interesting. That's really interesting. Um, I guess I... I have my misgivings about the idea of the society of outsiders and that I think I think feminism and social change and other other movements, um, progressive movements work best when they're relational and integrated in society. I don't think that to solve problems in, say, I don't know, in, in a university, you can solve that by founding a new university because that in itself could become quite exclusive and it excludes the people that you want to attract. Um, so I think I think that aspect of her of her thought is maybe a little naive. Yeah, fab. okay. Yeah. So so kind of founding new institutions is less good than actually uh yeah, we do need to still make institutional change and make open institutions. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely, definitely. Um really interesting. Thank you. Um I I've got, we've got a couple more um one uh, on a particular critic uh, who uh, some people may or may not know. So the question is, do you think a death to the author approach is useful when reading Wolf's work? Could you introduce us to the concept a little bit, Rowan, just sort of 30 seconds, and then explain whether or not you, you reckon it could be uh, useful in that context? Yeah, so the death of the author um, is a concept introduced by a French theorist you might have heard of by Roland Barthes. And so he argues that the author's opinion of a text and, and their, their ambition for text is not the final words, and it's the, it's the reader's interpretation 
which creates the text rather so that it kind of argues against this idea that the author is is kind of a godlike figure um and i think yeah i think it, it's definitely really useful and i think most of 20th century criticism wouldn't really be possible without the death of the author but i think when you're when you're discussing um works like by by feminist writers any any writers where identity is important i think the death of the author becomes a bit more controversial so i think the death of the author might be um, a bit more questionable if you were looking at say a post-colonial writer or something like that so i, th I think it's a really useful critical strategy but a, a writer in their context are always going to be somewhat relevant i think Fantastic. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting point. You don't always want to divorce the author. Um, definitely. Uh, and I just I popped in that, that question, um, what the name of the, the chapter that um, that comes from. Um, so uh, for anyone who's, who's interested in that, um, we haven't got too many more questions here. Um, if anyone does have any more questions, uh, feel free to, to, to pop them in. Um, I wonder whether just as a, a sort of um, a closing question. It just it, we might get a few more in a second, but um, Rowan, would you would you be able to have one recommendation for people who are interested in uh, learning more um, about Wolf? Uh, one one perhaps film or one book or something to go out and and have a look at or a blog or something that you could you could recommend to people. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think. Uh, if you're looking for a film that's really entertaining to watch, I would say Orlando, um, directed by Sally Potter. It stars Tilda Swinton as titular character um, Orlando, and it's just a really entertaining and interesting interpretation of the book. I definitely recommend. Um, and overall, I think the best, one of the best introductions to Wolf's work is A Room of One's Own. I mean, it's such a quick read. It's a hundred pages. You can reread it again and again, um, and you'll always get something new from it, as I found that I have. Fantastic. Thank you, Rowan. And I think is that now out of copyright, so it'll be available. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I ought to check that before I I say that to everyone. Um, I, I I I'm not sure. I think it's soon to be out of copyright. Um, but you you can find PDFs on on the internet and everything. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So um, two really grand recommendations there. Uh, thanks, Rowan. We've got one one question. It's just popped in. Um, uh, what kind of so the question is what not what could be a novel of comparison to a room of one's own or any other of Virginia Woolf's uh, novels? Um, so, I mean, I, I suppose what kind of contemporary things might you be comparing it to or non contemporary, I suppose. Uh, That's a really interesting idea. I think one point of comparison with Virginia Woolf in a contemporary context is how she's influenced the non-fiction creative writing that we see today because that's a really popular um, style of writing that you'll see across the internet um, and in newspapers as well. So I'd really recommend writing by Roxane Gay or Maggie Nelson if you're interested in reading more writing in that style. Um, it's, I think it's been really adopted by people in a contemporary context because it's a way to explore issues with um, like identity, feminism, race from a personal perspective, but also um, from this kind of exploratory creative perspective as well, where things are kind of speculative and um, uh, asking bigger questions at the same time. Fantastic. Thank you, Ren. Um, we have now we have suddenly got a, a flood of a few more questions. So um, if it's all right with everyone, else, we we can we can plug on with those. Um, I've got so let's see. Um, we've got one uh, that perhaps me and Richard could handle um, later about preparing for the ELAT. Um, perhaps uh, Rowan, I don't know whether you have any thoughts on on that. Um, for everyone. Um, Who's not aware the ELAT is the English Literature Admissions Test. Uh, Rowan, I, I don't know whether you did your undergraduate degree here or not, so you, that might not be relevant to you. Um, did, did you ever do the ELAT? I'm afraid I, I, I never applied to Oxford. I didn't study here for undergrads. I'm not very helpful in this case. No, absolutely fine. Absolutely <laughs> yeah. fine. Um, 
Rich is going to pop something in in the uh, Slido on that one. Um, so uh, do look out if you're interested. Um, certainly some past papers uh, would be, be a good place to start. Um, so uh, we've covered uh, a lot of kind of uh, feminist comparisons. Uh, well, one question here is is uh, asking essentially what what is it about Virginia Woolf that has uh, made her so renowned in comparison to her uh, female peers uh, writing writing at the time? Could, can you can you speak to that at all? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's really interesting to see what resonates in people about Wolf and why she's such a famous figure in feminism. And I think it's because of the breadth of her interest and maybe the fact that she wrote both um, nonfiction and fiction at the same time. So she was able to tackle issues from these, like a factual and more imaginative perspective. And the fact that she was interested in things like rights for working class women, but also um, the questions of like women's place in history and famous women writers. Um, and I, I guess part of it is is privilege as well. Like there's probably there's a lot of um, lesser discovered women's writers. Um, like the, there's writers like Zora Neale Hurston, for example, was an African American woman writing in, during a similar period. And she's not really featured on university curriculum in the same way as Virginia Woolf. So she does kind of, may, maybe the fact that she dominates um, reading lists so much might be taken as a negative point as well. And that, it, yeah, there's other women who might get overlooked in terms of feminist writing. Fantastic. That's that's a really interesting point. Um, is there any anything you could draw out in terms of comparison with uh, more recent feminist writers as well perhaps so is there any reason why you you reckon her work i suppose we, we talked about why it's relevant to feminism now but just generally in terms of her um her sort of critical status is there anything that's kind of supported her her, her position there yeah interesting um again i think it's because of like her openness to new interpretation and asking people to kind of respond to her in different contexts um, I think, yeah, I, I think people revisit her work at, in different times to see what new, what new ideas it might generate. So, for example, in the 1950s, Wolf wasn't considered a political writer. She was considered an aesthetic writer. But then during, um, like, the growth of feminism in the 1970s, she was kind of resurrected as a feminist writer and became a lot more popular. Um, and then in a contemporary context, people are rereading her work in terms of class politics and her thoughts about wider struggles in society. So I think that's kind of part of her enduring appeal. Yeah, fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, got a couple of perhaps closer questions now then. Um, so oh, someone mentioned they didn't catch the title of the book Rowan recommended. Um, it is A Room of One's Own, right, Rowan? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and yeah. the presentation will be sent out to everyone uh, afterwards, which has kind of uh, everything, well, a lot of the stuff we've, we've talked about today. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but I've also I've popped that in Slido just in case anyone wants to check that out. Um, so one more kind of um, more specific question, uh, which is uh, could her could any of Virginia Woolf's specific thoughts about feminism be interpreted as being sort of entirely disconnected, entirely separate from working class women's lives, that kind of separation of her experience? Definitely. I, I think in A Room of One's Own, the main idea that a woman needs a, a room of her own and money in order to write, I think people have found that quite alienating because that's not a privilege that all women will be, be afforded. So Alice Walker actually writes about that in a book called In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, where she's saying that historically black women in America wouldn't have had a room of their own or money. Um, and we're still living in really difficult economic times. So I, I think because of her perspective, people could find um, that kind of that kind of. Um, opinion of wolves a bit alienating but 
I, I think what still makes it relevant, though, is that she's grounding feminism in terms of economic realities. Um, so that makes it helpful to reread it. Fantastic. Yeah, it's a really good point. Um, OK, so to move on from that, then um, one kind of uh, one closer question in terms of kind of the, the arguments you've made today and the context you've placed Virginia in. Um, do women today have a room of their own in society? Realistically, does change have to be made by those from the privileged position that Wolf wrote from? Perhaps leaking onto your previous answer here as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, I think it's, we can still see that today is an issue. I mean, over the course of the pandemic, you can see how women have had to still work while shouldering like the larger burden of childcare. Um, I, I think uh, women uh, like across the classes have um, really suffered in this respect. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's a, it, it's kind of a difficult and maybe slightly depressing Definitely. issue to look into. Um, but yes. <laughs> Definitely, I mean, that's quite an open-ended question there, I suppose, and um, perhaps a rhetorical question for us all to take away as well uh, into our lives, um, uh, but not to, hopefully not to get too depressed by the phone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, something for us all to think about how we can act on it. Um, but uh, thank you, thank you for answering that very honestly as well. And 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 finally, just on a kind of uh, how 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 did you come to be where you are? Note. Uh, the question is, why did you choose to study Virginia Woolf? Uh, but perhaps you could give us a little bit more background on how you ended up uh, where you are today as well, um, in, in terms of your subject. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that's a good question. I studied English and French at St Andrews in Scotland, which I really loved. That gave me the opportunity to read widely, learn a second language. I, I studied and taught abroad for a couple of years. I then went back to St Andrews. I did a I did a master's in modernist literature, um, and that kind of like ignited the idea that I could do a PhD and potentially have an academic career. So um, yeah, I applied to Oxford, um, was accepted at Trinity, and started a PhD on, on in the modernist research group, which has been really fantastic. Um, yeah, I think the advice I'd have for for pursuing further study in in that way, I guess, would be to read widely um, and don't think that you have to rush into it as well. <laughs> Thanks. Fantastic. Um, and I assume that Virginia Woolf was, was just one of those authors that you, you found along the way that you really, really enjoyed that uh, sort of spoke to you. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. She was a huge part of my master's degree. Um, I think uh, so many people who read her at undergrads um, are really inspired by her um, and kind of she, I feel like she helps people develop an intellectual confidence by reading her work, which is really interesting. Um, mm. And she also introduced me to like a lot of other um, authors who, I, who I've since written about as part of my PhD. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you, Rowan. Um, a really, a really glowing kind of um, you, you've 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 answered so many questions so fantastically. Uh, it's it's been it's been a joy to to listen to you um, today. So I, I just want to say, yeah, on, on behalf of myself, certainly, uh, hopefully everyone here, uh, thank you so much um, for your talk uh, and, and, and your time.